for joining us. As you know, I'm retiring from the fire service. So I have an interest in mental wellness for the fire service. But of course, I have an interest in mental wellness for people retiring and people at large. Yep. So, and I know that's a passion, obviously, for both of you. So could I get one of you first to maybe give a brief explanation of, say, moral injury? Because that, a lot of people might not be familiar with that term. Maybe, uh, Michael, would you mind giving us a bit of a, an explanation of what you mean by moral I, I injuries? Think, uh, doctor, uh, the doctor is probably more of an expert than I am. So but I've aren't you working on finishing a PhD? <laughs> Well, yeah, but mine is in clinical psychology. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's it's concurrent. It's addictions and concurrent disorders. But the the moral injury, I'm actually a student of that right now. So I think the doctor could probably right. give us both a lesson on moral injury. All right, Dr. Margaret, I'll leave it to you then. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. So I'm just going to add to you, my dad was the assistant deputy fire marshal for the province. So I have a pretty strong interest in firefighters and just want to say like hello to the community and nice to see you. So, you know, moral injury really is a concept that developed initially with military members and soldiers. And so the idea there was that oftentimes in the combat theater, people are asked to do things that may violate their moral or ethical values. And they have to do those things. And I think it's important to remember that. So an example may be when a military member is being approached by a, a young person, a child perhaps, who you know, appears to be threatening and they may have to take the life of that child. And that is something that obviously violates, as Romeo Dallaire has told us so many times, really violates our ethical and moral standards. Um, and he's spoken very eloquently about his time in, in Rwanda when he had to witness in some cases the slaughter during the Rwandan genocide. And he came home and said, really, it's the moral injury, that it wasn't fear or panic um, that drove his his injury. It was in fact that moral that said that he had to violate moral or ethical beliefs. Um, there's a secondary part though to moral injury that's talked about less frequently. And that's the concept of betrayal. And so oftentimes institutions that have a duty or individuals that have a duty to protect um, may fail to do so or may be perceived to fail to do so. And so oftentimes that's ca captured in the military context where veterans may say, you know, I didn't feel adequately, adequately supported by Veterans Affairs Canada. Um, I work very closely with the military. And so I just wanna say that I work closely with Veterans Affairs and the Canadian Armed Forces. And what Veterans Affairs Canada will often say is that one of the major barriers um, to recovery is some of that underlying anger. So anger towards government, anger towards individuals, and that's also a form of moral injury. But anger is a, is a really a secondary emotion. When people talk about anger, we want to unpack that down to what's driving that. And sometimes that's that sense of betrayal that people didn't feel adequately protected. Okay, can I toss it to one of you to maybe explain PTSD? So, well, I, I can maybe pick up on that. Um, so PTSD, again, uh, the concept I believe started in the military and um, is something that uh, has come to be seen in our frontline workers and our first responders. And in effect, what it is, um, and there's a component of it that relates to the moral injury, but what in effect uh, it is, uh, is an individual that is, and, and PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. Typically it arises out of a trauma and the trauma is uh, relating to something that someone has seen, someone that uh, something that someone has experienced. So we see complex trauma and PTSD in victims of uh, violent crimes, uh, rape victims, uh, uh, you know, those that have suffered from uh, domestic uh, abuse. We also see it in uh, indigenous uh, um, individuals that uh, had lived through the residential school, or alternatively, when there are issues of attachment as well, and the implications that has later on in life uh, to the individuals. Uh, it's something that um, is very significant to our first responders, and uh, really needs to look at it in a more uh, complete and uh, 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 in-depth way. Uh, you know, my first position uh, was as Solicitor General for the province, and I got a chance to meet many first responders. And the first responders I met when we talked about uh, PTSD, the first thing that I thought was, well, what have we done to educate? What, what have we done to build resiliency? Um, and those were some of the issues that we started dealing with in terms of looking at the materials that were being provided in the colleges. Uh, what was being done uh, to unpack an event? 
because again, PTSD isn't something that happens as a result of one event, but it's cumulative over the course of time. And the implications of it are, are uh, severe. They, they're they're life altering um, for individuals that suffer from them. And unfortunately, um, you know, because uh, uh, first responders and frontline workers for me are different breeds of people. They, they have a vocation. And when you have a vocation, you, you hold yourself to a higher standard than, than, than other people do. You don't go to work for a paycheck. You go to work because you really believe in helping other people and making a difference in people's lives. So when you're not able to save that life or you see something that is shocking to you um, over the, type, the course of time, if you're not prepared, if you don't have the skill set to, to ensure that you're looking after your own wellness, because you know, you're all tough guys and all tough women, you suck it up. And that has a tendency of building. And over the course of time, eventually, it you know, creates larger issues, um, which, which ultimately are the PTSD. And then unfortunately, what comes with that is looking to self-medicate and find ways of, of you know, improving the living condition by um, substance and, and substances. And unfortunately, that leads to more complicated problems. And if I can thank you. That, oh, so, you sorry, mind. If you wouldn't mind if I followed up on that, you know, I, I wanted to relate that back to the concept of moral injury. So often PTSD is thought about as a fear-based disorder, but for many people, when they experience PTSD, it comes with guilt and shame and an inability to experience positive emotions like joy. And so for many people, you can imagine a firefighter, for example, a fire captain who had to make a choice about whether or not to go to a burning building and knowing that there were children inside um, and having to make that call not to go in. And so that PTSD that, that that firefighter, that fire captain might experience is likely not related to fear, but rather some of the guilt and shame that he or she may be experiencing afterwards. And so I think it's really important when, as, as the minister is saying, when we think about PTSD, that we think beyond that fear-based conceptualization and really include moral injury and those feelings of guilt and shame as part of the clinical picture, as part of the picture that people experience day to day in their mm -hmm. lives. And, you know, if you're a parent and you go home after making that call, how do you look at your own children? How do you feel as a father or a mother afterwards? Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, doctor, because I remember a, a situation where that came up and we were, we were speaking about it. And I realized that when we talk about, you know, when in addictions, which is what I'm more of a, of a uh -huh. I, I can call myself an expert, but the area that I understand a little deeper, uh, we talk about the biopsychosocial model. Yes. And in the work that I did before coming to government, we used to always include and the spiritual, uh -huh. because you cannot heal unless you, you heal that spiritual side. So when you talk about that guilt, that guilt derives from the fact that an individual feels, well, they have a vocation. We know they're different. Mm -hmm. So the, the moral injury, the guilt uh, is something that you carry around like weights mm -hmm. on the shoulders. And you know, to unburden that weight is to give that person the ability to you know, continue doing their job, but more importantly, living their lives because that's what's ultimately impacted. And then when you look at your family, if you haven't had that experience, they can seem like babies to you, right? They're innocent. They haven't had that same experience. And I think for many first responders, they come home, they walk through the door and they've been, mm -hmm. you know, at a call like that, at the scene of an accident, walk through the door and have to become a mother or father instantaneously around, you know, people who have, haven't had the same experiences. I don't know, if Cynthia, if that was your experience during the time that you so, yeah, it, it certainly was, you know, you're, you're, you're one thing by day and another thing by night. Uh, there's certainly a lot of that. Uh, you, you two have made some really, really interesting points. And I, and I love the, the parallels that you, you've pointed out to people here between PTSD and moral injury. And we hear a lot about cumulative stress, mm -hmm. and it almost sounds like cumulative stress is the precursor to both or or at least one of them and without without the resilience that minister tobolo talked about without teaching those skills i think we're putting people at greater risk for the the accumulation to turn into an injury or a disorder and i i think that's a 
a fascinating difference. So how, and because we're, you know, I, I have an interest in retiring, you know, <laughs> turns out I like being off work. It's wonderful being retired, but these things don't just go away. Some people might not even acknowledge that they have either of these things. Mm -hmm. So between the two of you, that's what I'm going to bounce back to you. What should people do if they think they have a problem? And how can retirement either fix it or exacerbate it? What are your thoughts? Doctor? Oh, you know, I think for many people have had emotions throughout their careers. I think about first responders, particularly those in the past, who've had emotions and thoughts and struggles throughout their career, but haven't necessarily had the words to put around that because there was so much stigma in the past around you know, PTSD and trauma and depression. And so sometimes learning about these concepts can be helpful because it helps you to understand your own experience. But for some people um, in retirement, they may, you know, PTSD can happen many years after an incident. It doesn't have to happen immediately afterwards. Or you may begin to understand where some of these feelings or thoughts are coming from. If you're finding that that is distressing you, so you find it very distressing or you find it's interfering with your life, with your family, with your friends. It's a really good time to visit your GP who can help you to provide assistance. So often the first line of where to go is to see your GP and talk about some of this. And I think retirement can be helpful in the sense that, you know, you have more time, more freedom, but it may also there may be also be fewer social connections. So we know, for example, when military members leave service, it's actually very difficult for them because of the shift in their identity. So they've been a helper, they've been a soldier, and now suddenly they've left and they have a different identity. And as Minister Thibault was saying, these are special people, like first responders, all of us have a vocation, right? And when that vocation is gone, that's difficult because your identity shifts. And so really maintaining that social support is the most protective factor against trauma globally, study after study after study, having that connection. So part of it may be maintaining your connections with your own fr your old friends in the fire service. It may be you know, building new connections, strengthening new relationships. But I think that would be one very important, important part of how to maintain mental wellness during a time of transition. Okay. Uh, Minister Tobol, I know that uh, more stuff is rolling out. Uh, there's a new program. Uh, certainly through the fire marshal's office for resilience and some training for the fire service. I know the police uh, have similar programs. And of course I have friends in the military. They also are looking at these um, mental wellness programs. So do you wanna talk about that just a little bit, how that helps build resilience, the education portion? Yeah, I, I think it, uh, and, and just to build on uh, the doctor used a couple of words that I, I think are really important. Stigma is a huge issue. Uh, for first responders, and we should not uh, underestimate their inability or their um, lack of volunteering or wanting to volunteer personal uh, information like that. And we have to get over that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you guys are all flesh and blood too. So you have to uh, allow people in and you, you know, the peer to peer to support. So uh, maintaining those relationships are really important. And I always say that if you retire, you never retire because there's always work to be done as a volunteer if you choose right. to do it. And there are a lot of people that need help. Um, and on that point, when it comes to what is the government doing, I always start off by saying that the government can't do everything. The government can certainly ensure that policies are put in place that uh, recognize the, the importance of first responders and frontline workers and the work that they do, and that they need to have the resources available to them to stay mentally fit. And that means from training. I can remember a solicitor general, can I have a copy of the curriculum at uh, the fire college? And they brought it to me and it was, I, I mean, I could have made one paper airplane and it would have taken flight really well. It was like, there was nothing, no substance to it. And the police college was no better. Um, so I, that was one of the first things I implemented. How can you put someone into a position of having expo being exposed to those difficult situations and not give them the tools that they need to understand the triggers and the uh, and, and, and what to do in terms of, you know, uh, going into, you know, what, what, what are their expectations? Like, you've got to give them an understanding of how to handle those situations. So our work uh, started by, by looking and ensuring that the training programs were there. 
Um, we also invested in terms of, you know, providing psychiatric supports. Um, in a lot of cases, police forces and, and uh, all first responders have access to psychologists. Um, and, and that is really important to basically have the health care workers, the mental health care workers available. Uh, more needs to be done, um, but, but fundamentally those are the things is recognizing the importance of having the proper supports in place. We're also, as a, as a, a, a project that the Premier um, is endorsing and something that I certainly stand behind because of the unique nature of our first responders and frontline workers and military, um, a lot of times our psychiatric hospitals are not the right place for them to go for help. That's right. um, I've, you know, not read a lot of articles, doctor, I'm aware of two articles that have been written that are relatively current that mm -hmm. basically say, you build it, we won't come. Yeah. But if you build an institution that's focused on frontline workers and first responders that looks after their needs exclusively, you build it, they will come. And that's something that we recognize as a government. We recognize uh, both the premier, myself, and of course, all the people that have uh, have informed us that that we need to do that. We need to do it relatively quickly so that we have the right supports for individuals. Yeah, I, let I me see if I can, Mari, let me just see if I can tie a piece to that for a second. Okay, sure. So I thought it was interesting that you mentioned, you know, like one piece of paper at police college, one piece of paper basically at the fire college. I am an ICU trauma unit nurse by trade. Yeah, and remember. there was absolutely zero pieces of paper yeah. on how to handle trauma and how to deal with working in eMERGE or working there. So it, it really is universal. And I certainly understand and respect your point about if you build it for them, they'll come because no firefighter, police officer or nurse wants to be recuperating from their mental issues next to the person that they just arrested or yeah. whose stomach they just pumped out or who's, you know, yeah. whose yeah. child you just yeah. saved. So yeah. those are all very interesting connected pieces. Yeah, I've actually done some work on that, Cynthia. So we actually looked, um, we did qualitative interviews with 64 first responders um, at Homewood Health Center in Guelph. And what we found is that they really did want a separate stream for military members and civilians. And so as first responders and civilians, so we established that on the unit because we knew that they needed to be treated separately. And part of, I think, what first responders worry about is that if they tell their stories, they might harm someone by telling them, right? If you have a civilian in the room, it's very difficult to disclose, you know, using the jaws of life in a triage situation. That's, a civilian doesn't, you know, really need to hear that, right? And you wanna be also in a situation where you're free to discuss what happened to you. So I think that is a really critical point. Um, I just wanna make one other comment. I'm a person who had PTSD, a person who had depression. Um, I've always been very open about that. And I think it is very important to challenge that stigma um, that surrounds the illness. You know, I always like to say, you know, I, I had PTSD, I was treated successfully, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm a professor, and really it was from recovery, right? Recovery is always possible. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I and and you know, it's and again, I hate to to draw the analogy, but it's where I'm most comfortable. In addictions, we always talk about children and youth and investing in education, yeah. um, and and it builds resiliency. And you can reduce addictions by twenty five percent if you invest. Yeah. So why aren't we doing more to invest in our first responders and our frontline workers to give them those resiliency skills to ensure that they're healthy and able to function? I mean, it costs a lot of money and I don't want to reduce it to dollars, but it costs a lot of money to train our first responders. Oh, it does. Yeah. Safe. And I mean, $25,000 is what to, yeah. to, to, to get yeah. a volunteer firefighter up to snuff training yeah. is $25,000 equipment and training. And to lose them very quickly is, yeah. you know, if it is it is dollars and cents. So I, I I think some of that and is really and you were talking and I had another question and I totally derailed my train of thought. That's so crazy. that's okay. That's okay. So let's let's circle back to something positive because we're we're just about out of time here. So what is the upside for people who are retiring mm. and? They, they want to either, should they go get a, I, I mean, I went and, you know, I went to the dentist and I went to the eye doctor before I retired. 
Should I get, should people go get a neck up checkup? What mm. should people do if they're retiring and they just want to, you know, start the next chapter off on a really positive note? What do you think? Should I take it first and then I'll, I'll pass it? Go ahead. It. So for me, the most important thing that anyone could do is not forget that we are creatures of habit and you need to have a routine. So regardless of whether you're retired or not, you need purpose. So when you get up in the morning, what are the things that you like to do? And those are the same things you were doing before when you were working, just that you get to enjoy them a little bit more now than before. You know, the social contacts that the doctor mentioned to me are extremely important. We're social animals. I've been living in a room that's about 14 by 14 for I don't know how many years of months. It feels like years. It's like years. <laughs> the one thing is sitting at home having dinner with my wife. Yeah. Um, you know, it's only, like I don't mean to say there's anything wrong with it, but you get tired of it, right? I went out with some friends that that um, uh, when we could and had dinner and I came back and I was completely rejuvenated. Relationships are really important and not it doesn't have to be the one relationship with the one person. And clearly COVID has shown us that we need to have that social contact. So those need to be maintained and then enjoy each moment that you have. You've earned your retirement. And, and, and utilize it to, to you know, to, to, to develop, you know, I love to keep bees and I know one day I'll have more beehives and, and, and you know, I love to fish and I know I'm going to fish all the rivers in the province all over again when I get the chance to do it. So you do the things that you love to do, be passionate and uh, like we say in Italian, amore e passione, do everything with love and passion and every day will be your glass half full, not half empty. All right, Margaret, I'm going to give you the last word. You've got a minute and a half. Um, okay. And if I run out of Zoom time, I will call you both back. But Margaret, you have the last word. Take it away. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I'm sitting here at St. Joe's in Hamilton in our mental health facility. And, you know, it never hurts to learn more about your mental health. Um, it doesn't have to be going to somebody who specialized in mental health. It could be simply having a conversation with someone, for example, your GP, you know, you may, you may want to go to a psychologist, you may want to seek other services with a therapist, but I think just generally having that conversation and being open is the most important thing. We need to allow ourselves to be open, to tell our own stories and also for other people to hear them. So well, that was great. Good. Thank you both very, very much. I think uh, a lot of people are going to be interested in what you've both had to say. So one second.